Sometimes forces collide. Let's... let's just... <laughs> <laughs> Leave it in. Leave it in. We're using that as the introduction. This is the Entitled Banter Podcast. The UBP, the UBP, the UBP. Good Lord. Joined by What Culture Wrestling's Michael Sidgwick. Hello. And also Michael Hamflit. All right. Fill it in. Where well, the camera's going. We're on the camera. We're I was going to say. studio in a week. People who want to see what's going on can go to the What Culture Wrestling Podcast channel over on the YouTubes. Because we haven't filmed a UBP before. Or if we have, I've genuinely forgot. However, Josh Brown is away, so I've recruited the two Dadly boys of War Culture, or two-thirds of them anyway. He'll be and buzzing about that. Oh yeah, I'll go away for a week and it finally gets on camera. <laughs> I know, we're making general strides forward. However, the UBP is always where we dive into people's questions, talking points, etc. Whatever they've got going on, uh, which is to say the first one is from JP, who says, UBP, being a dad of a three-year-old, I'm getting closer to her first video game. What should it be? Something from my childhood or something recent? Go with your gut. My experience, I've got a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. Uh, the nine-year-old, I went with... I think I tried to do something from my youth. Mm. And I was like, I think because, you know, it makes sense. Like I learned the mechanics of video uh, games and how to play them, etc. cetera. Um, through Sonic, I was a Mega Drive kid. Oh, and yeah. Sonic was the first game I played, the first game. What do you call it? I used to call it a clocked. <laughs> when you beat something. When you beat, when you beat the game. <laughs> I was just went with beats, but I know people use that. Flipped as well. Flipped. Or, uh, yeah, that's an arcade thing. It's like you flip that thing. Flip the board. Down. Kicked it on his ass and flipped it. <laughs> Flip reversed it, actually. Actually, this is the day. This is the day of Sonic Shadow Generations remastered, which might mean very little to you. But there's a there's a new Sonic game out right now. Shadow's the new lad in the film, isn't he? Yes, I'm voiced by Keanu I'm Reeves. The new, lad. the new lad. Right, they always stick. They always stick a new one in each film. I'm buzzed for that. Yeah, man. Yeah. So Sonic didn't really take that much. You know what's odd, right? Mm. It's like our nostalgia is so powerful and what seems so sort of like intuitive to us. It's like well, not that much younger. It's got to be the same thing. Mm. It's like old-fashioned black and white films to these kids who yeah. they see so much like CGI and great graphics just like when they're watching YouTube or whatever that this stuff just feels prehistoric to them. I reckon, right, three, I reckon you'll struggle with three. Okay. I understand you might be completely desperate to do this, but three in terms of just... I mean, oh, Sonic 3? No, man, three years old, Scott. <laughs> I was going to say Sonic 2 is what you want, mate. It's a Sonic 3. Carry on. At least get the Knuckles one for the other. So, oh, yeah. so three years old in terms of like the, you know, the, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, Hand-eye coordination yeah. and stuff like that. No, no, Scott. Uh, like they're just the actual cognitive ability and motor skills to be able mm. to grapple with the controller. Blah, 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 blah. My daughter's six. Maybe I started too late, right? Maybe my jeans aren't very good. Mario Kart 8 for the Switch. It's got the setting, right, where if you just play Mario Kart title and you listen to this podcast, you go on 150, 200cc, and you just go, okay, let's go. If you're a kid, it's just like there's a lot of buttons. You've got to, like, staying on the track mm. is impossible to right. them. They can't get it, the steering. If you get Mario Kart 8 for the Switch, um, you, there are two settings on it that you probably don't even know if you've played it yourself, where you can do auto accelerate and auto steer and it's a really good function for children because if you just put those two settings on you don't have to do anything except move your um joystick yes it depends where you're from yeah. Yep. What's the little gimmick on a joystick? Like, because I would think of it as a joystick, but it feels like it should have a different name from the N64 oh, it's like, one. An, like PS, PlayStation's analog sticks. You've got we'll analog, analog sticks. Yeah. Controllers, the Joy-Con. Yeah. We'll like yeah. the stick in the we'll middle. Go, the you stick. know what I mean? The little, the little yeah. stick gimmick. The little the guy. Little guy in, in a little guy in there. <laughs> so all you have to do if you apply those two settings on behalf of your kids is that it learn it teaches them you don't have to press any too many buttons it's not too overwhelming intimidating you can simply just steer steer and because if you put it on 50 cc like you're going to win yeah like you're just guaranteed to win so you get them the validation of winning the confidence that you're doing something right it's not like one of those intimidating games where you can get lost or you die instantly <laughs> so you're automatically glued to the track mm -hmm. you don't even have to press go you just have to get to grips with steering and then you go, you know, you get weapons. If they get hit by a weapon, it's like, why can't I do that? And it's like, well, press L or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then they can do that. And then eventually, it's like, if they get a little bit bored, it's like, knock one of the settings off. It's like, right, you can press go and you can yes. feel like you're driving the yeah. car. So that for me worked with um, Charlotte, my youngest daughter, or well, my young daughter. If they're a little bit older and they require a bit more of a challenge, right? If you've got an old, um, what do you call it? We, I played Kirby's Epic Yawn with my oh, son. Kirby's ball. Epic Yawn is great. And why I play it, he can't die. 
Mm. You cannot die on this game. Kirby's the most inviting thing yeah. ever anyway. It's got this like really visual feast and like the characters are really sort of like cuddly or whatever, non-threatening to a young child. <laughs> um, you cannot die. That's a really cool um, two-player mechanic where you help each other. Um, that's honestly like one of the fondest memories I've got with my sons playing that. Hamflat I've talked for ages. <laughs> I have, well, I have no nostalgia over Kirby, but the most recent Kirby for the Switch... My one of my sons is banging Lost Kingdom. Too. Yeah, mm. Lost Kingdom. Yeah, and man. again, playing co-op, like he's mostly completed it by himself, but then when I've done extra stuff with him to like finish getting the levels to hundred percent, whatever mm. it is, I'll play that with him. And it's lush. Like I wanna see Kirby eat stuff and then become like a different yeah. shape. Like oh, um, when he eats the car. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Like, like but to the Frankie like, though. I'm also going to stick with the Switch, which might speak to this being mm. what it's all about for kids that age. My youngest was four when Josh Brown, like we'll name check him yet again, very <laughs> kindly, when I bought a Switch, it was during the pandemic, and he very kindly gifted me um, Super Mario Odyssey. Mm. And I was a bit of a Sonic kid as well, but the affection I had for Mario was side-scrolling Mario. So yeah. instantly I was a bit, I never played uh, your favourite 64. 64 I, mean, yeah. I never played that, so I was a little bit like rattled by three-dimensional Mario. It right, like, okay. I don't think it's going to work for me. <laughs> but he gravitated towards it straight away, and it was piss easy because we did the co-op thing where I, I was cappy. You don't have to do much, mm. but I could just help him with those little trickier bits. Mm. And on assist mode, until you can just switch it off, again, you could die, but you would always build up enough coins. It was re it was, felt harder to die. Um, no matter how much you were like losing an obstacle or whatever. Mm. It's got the arrows as well, so you yeah. can have to get lost. It, you never felt like you could get too lost and you could complete the story mode without having to like fulfill many of the objectives. Yep. So each level would be say, well, you got to do these 10 things and you can move on. So he was, I could see he was feeling a sense of achievement. Mm. <laughs> his brother inadvertently saved over his save file after he'd completed it, which should have been complete. Like That is part of every childhood, though, yeah. at some point. My wife rang me. I was still at work, I think. She was like, can you find this save file? I just felt like my stomach. I think I messaged you. I was <laughs> yeah. like, is there a way to recover Please. this? Try and try. Couldn't recover it, whatever. Thought, right, how, how's this going to go? Mm -hmm. By this point, he'd done it enough himself, just in the background on handheld on a night or something. We said, oh, you can have our own switch or whatever. He just completed it again all by himself. Nice. And it had obviously been that little run through we'd had together. So it's a game that we completed together, which was a nice experience. It might be what like your listener is after here. However, mm. I will say like it seemed to teach him the mechanics of gameplay as well. And mm. I've not had to really coach him on anything. I'm no good at games, so he could, <laughs> he's better than me at most now. But through that, it seems to have given him the mindset of just, oh yeah, there's multiple buttons. There's lots of things I'm going to need to do, but I can. And the game's perfect. This is I, it. I think, an excellent I think game. it's a flawless game, Mario yeah. Odyssey. So. Well, that's the thing. This is an interesting thing because, um, yeah, like my kid's only like seven months at the minute. So like it is that thing of when So what's he on right now? <laughs> uh, Resident Evil 7. But, um, <laughs> it is that thing of like trying to introduce certain titles to try and replicate the journey through games that I had and be like, okay, you should probably start with something 2D, get a feel for that. A lot of people say like play the, even the very first Mario. It's like that, that's what a jump feels like in a video game. Yeah. Like you hold the button a bit longer, you go a bit higher. And then, I mean, Mario in gaming history kind of dictated what a jump feels like. And Sonic kind of Mania is good for that. Yeah, Sonic Mania is awesome. But like it is that thing of like, do you try and replicate that? Do you go back and pick something older or something 2D or whatever? Or do you just give them, because both your examples are like kind of like the newest Mario Kart, the newest Kirby, the newest Mario. Um, and that really works. Like newest Nintendo is going to be the most immediate, the most yeah. accessible. Um, and that's interesting. It's like, do you just start with the most, the freshest thing? I think Nintendo is a good one to go with. Um, just in terms of the bar of, like the accessibility bar is super low. Um, and there's so many assists, like you mentioned with Mario Kart. Um, I don't, I haven't picked my stuff yet. Like, yeah, I was a Sonic kid, but I don't want to throw them into Sonic. That seems an insane thing. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'll tell you what's good. Um, Rayman Legends. Ciao, yes it is. Yeah. Rayman Origins is awesome as well. Yeah. I was gonna throw, I was gonna mention, um, we'll get past one question at some point, but um, that idea that like parents do where you hook them up with a controller, but it's not plugged in and you just play the game and then they go, oh, I'm doing really well. Have either of you done that? You, yeah. can, you can gaslight your children all <laughs> yeah. at one day. Yeah, Absolutely like. easy money. <laughs> <laughs> when they're two, they haven't got a clue what's going on. No. Yeah. They haven't got a goddamn clue. <laughs> Let's play in Doom, Doom 2016. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, doing yeah. really well here. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. working very well. Um, yeah, I think I'll do some of that. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Suck. A uh, question from Lee Forster. <laughs> Blame your kid. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Go left. Question from Lee Forster who says, this toddler dad refuses to pay 70 pounds for games and can wait for a dip in price. I'm thankful the PlayStation Plus has been on the ball lately. Currently living on Cult of the Lamb. What was the last or greatest gem you found on PlayStation Plus or subscription services? Now I included this. Um, you might have subscription services. I don't know, but I wanted to have a, a general conversation on price points. Like I know you'll wait and get something a bit later. And um, like you just picked up Doom 2016. Um, but yeah, thoughts on pricing around the industry, like, um, cause we grew up with it, but the prices are higher than ever now. See, the thing with me, right, is I'm a casual gamer. 
And as a result, if I'm going to spend money and I've got two kids, like um, mortgage, holiday, all the rest of it, like I'm very selective with what I use mm. with my disposable income. It usually goes on coffee. I think cool. that from someone, like if you look at the time investment ratio, like the modern, outside of Nintendo, um, the modern gaming landscape has just completely priced me out or alienated mm. me. Um, if, I mean, when GTA 6 comes out, I'm going to find a way to buy that. <laughs> I am, and I'm going to just enjoy spending the money on that. Mm. But yeah, I just think it's absolutely out of control. Um, I think that it just seems very... It just seems like the gaming industry now has moved away. Yes, there will be titles if you look deep enough in terms of like... Th- retro titles mm. that I'll pick up and play. But in terms of what sort of you know about and can't be asked to not research into, it's always these... My perception of the gaming industry and, and price points in terms of what's it called, AAA? Yeah. Right, okay. I know I'm sounding very ignorant here, but maybe the one who appealed to me in this industry that I hear in, is in shambles a lot might not be in shambles. So maybe I'm a good <laughs> reference point for this. It just feels like such a pricey, alienating, complete arse on an experience <laughs> where I don't want to buy a game uh-huh. that costs a ridiculous 70 quid that I know is going to be, or I hear is going to be buggy, that is going to be so fixated on not the pleasure of the game, but the immersive details about right. which I don't really care, um, that it will take you ages to even download to your system. Mm-hmm. Why even have a disc or, you know... This is, they I, just, about this. I, I, I get an immediate sense of can't be asked. I don't mm-hmm. care how rave reviewed the game is. I get an immediate sense of I just can't be bothered with mm-hmm. this. That's it. Whenever, whenever I've been on the uh, wrestling podcast and we talk about the casual wrestling fan and like some of the opinions that come from that and those wider talking points, it's so it's you want like that wider t- conversation with someone who isn't keeping up with the thing you're super into. And it is interesting because like right now console sales are dropping off and like um, general expenditure is a lot lower. And um, it is interesting is the average person just going like I can't be asked with. This. Yeah. Uh, overall, um, and like something like the PlayStation Five Pro got announced, and everyone was like, "What for? Why?" Like it's more of the deals that you mentioned, um, and I'm putting my own bias into it because I do think it's a pointless purchase. Um, but it is something like the PS Five Pro is indicative of everything current, quote unquote, wrong with the industry, um, and getting obsessed with graphics and things like that. But um, file sizes, we're recording this on the day that Call of Duty Black Ops Six is out. That's 320 gig, so that's like most of a hard drive. Like you're wiping out most of your collection to make it fit. Um, but the pricing points that you mentioned, like being priced out of the industry. Um, ironically, Nintendo are one of the companies that have kept like £70 for like the new Breath of the Wild, the, the, the Zelda or Tears of the Kingdom. Um, you know, Kirby, Mario, they're all pretty high, um, but at least they're not buggy. And it's like, yeah, at least you get yeah. in something you're going to be able to play. But um, Hamford, thoughts on all of this? It's funny you mention about console sales, because when you ask the question, the only thing I had as a sort of experience that I've lived with in terms of spending money on games that isn't just a traditional 40, 50 pound, buy the game, take the game mm. home, play it, is the fact that my kids at the moment are like always asking for, for birthdays or Christmases, uh, vouchers for Fortnite, Roblox, or one of the other ones, can't remember, but like you can picture them in your standard answer mm. at this point, you know, and it's, that is how I am spending on things that in my mind, oh, they already have. It's like there right. is a bunch of free games they can play on Roblox, but I do understand you know, that you would want your characters to be better or you want this extra extension or you would want a better level, whatever it is. Whatever I mean, look, we're wrestling it. fans. Can you imagine if you've got like away kit attire on Hasbro exactly. figures? You know, you just want, you would want it. You and want I need, it, I need that it. second figure, please. He's 39 yeah. and he still needs it. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, so I get that. Mm. Um, ultimately, because I suppose I've drawn... Imagine getting green cane in 1999. Exactly, that's, you know know that's I mean? a tenner. Easy. Yeah. easy. Yeah. I just like, got a tenner for the Keanu Reeves shadow add-on in, uh, in the new Sonic game. Yeah. So I'm also sick. But like, weirdly, it's sort of a, it's a, a line I appear to have inadvertently drawn mm. uh, when it comes to console games. They get, they get, and it is the Switch mainly. We've got an inherited PS4 that I'll like, we'll play from time mm. to time. But I think it helps at the moment not being at the forefront of the technology. If at some point one of them wants a PS5 and then all of a sudden you're wanting releases that are sort of in line with maybe what they're made to play, mm-hmm. like they will succumb to peer pressure and I will succumb to their peer pressure. <laughs> there's that like, there's that... This, I don't want to like, get too deep into parenting, but a lot of the times now, mine are at an age at 9, 11, where you kind of have to imagine what conversations they might be having with their mates and mm. trying to judge when you can afford to get them the thing or when you can just allow them to have the mates take the piss out of them for not having the thing. It's a, the yeah. ugly reality of like playground yeah. conversations. Minecraft that, more like minefield. 
Very good. There's also, I mean, yeah, um, that's, that's a game. That's a game in humour. Minesweeper right? is what we grow. With. But, um, but it's like, whereas at the moment it's completely isolated to the iPad and vouchers. That's a system I can wrap my head around. So just nailed it. There is a like, there's a fatigue when I read about a game getting released. Oh, let alone yeah. the idea of buying, playing, re-downloading, installing the idea that fixing you have to play hours ahead of time, patching as they call. <laughs> yeah, this. <laughs> This, <laughs> yeah, it's, they've said you double checking the terminology like yeah. We used to like I'm trusting the audience today will accept a certain overlap. We yeah. used to review a WWE product that was so abhorrent and awful on a weekly basis, you almost couldn't fathom that yet again another week had gone by where it existed. True. Feels like that's where we're at with like new release games. All I read is that from as from a very, very casual or from speaking to you, or whatever, is where it's it's coming out broken, but they're gonna have it fixed in two weeks. That is that, definitely And that's the norm, where yeah. we're at now, is it that's yeah. just the accepted norm. And then like you'll read words of like people that have left like development agencies or whatever that have just had a nightmare experience mm-hmm. because they've been pushed to breaking point. That sounds like Vince McMahon's writers. Yeah. Like it's just like right, capitalism has squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, and luckily there's a customer base that will still Pay. Yeah, man. It's um, it's a, it's a certain thing with like production levels, like the indie space. The um, if there's not as many, if you haven't got to answer to shareholders saying like, can you not release it now? Like then you have a bit more of a, a bit more time to put things together. Um, but the triple A space, the bigger the production levels, then yeah, there's more staff, there's more things that can go wrong. Um, and yeah, I mean something like Assassin's Creed Shadow has got pushed like a whole. Uh, it's back into February next year. It was meant to be out next month. Um, just to try and put more stuff into it so they can try and justify the 70 pounds and whatever. Um, but yeah, in terms of, uh, I'll move on, but in terms of um, gems on PlayStation Plus or subscription services, uh, get yourself a month of Ubisoft Plus and play Star Wars Outlaws. Uh, I'm just, that's just, I'm throwing that in. I, uh, I really like that game. Um, also Prince of Persia, The Lost Kingdom, uh, or Lost Crown. Question from Jack Jingle, who says, anyone have memories of playing wrestling booking sims? Remember having Extreme Warfare Revenge back in the day? Think you can still get a version of it now on Steam, but I haven't played one in years. I don't, know if, I don't know if either of you played these. Get it on TV, it's called AW. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never played them, so I'll hand off very you addicted, did, didn't you? Addicted right, to this. I never even heard of this. Yeah, so like, well, it's just book your own territory, yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, EWR was big for a while. A lot of this, we've talked so much about like gaming with kids. This is like a part of my life I had to park until the kids are older enough that I get the time back to right. invest because it would be the sort of thing uh, whereas I wasn't lucky enough to work here mm. I would spend my days in work fantasy booking my territory of things I could do when I would get I would literally note down things like I'll book that later on and then, like that would have That's that cool. like because it would just it would engage with you on a, a level that you couldn't with the actual product because you had no control over it it's as obvious as it sounds mm. right you want to we sit here around these tables every week thinking that we can do a better job of booking territories and a game gives you an opportunity to mm-hmm. do so. And what was cool is that they kind of developed with, um, they sort of developed with the technology hand in hand. So the old text-based ones in the late nineties were enough because that was kind of the peak of tech. Whereas into the sort of, well, the mid 2000s is when I dropped off with them, but I'm mm-hmm. assuming they still go on to this day. You just had like improvements in the user interface and the mm-hmm. graphics and the, like the availability is the rosters because you could download updates Whereas the original ones, they'd kind of just, they'd make that version of the game and that would be your favorite. And then rather than doing an update, it'd be like, right now, here comes version nine. Right. And then they'd make changes and like, oh, that's gone now. I would rather play version eight, but with new rosters. Mm. Whereas now you could probably keep your favorite version and then just somebody online will create like a, oh, do you want a um, 1997 WWE roster? Here you go, bang. And like all the business terms will be suited to that era. So in that respect, that, like line has been as perfect as it's ever been because you can go back and rebook historic eras and mm-hmm. make little changes you would have wanted to make. I've not been able to uh, tiptoe into that world as much as I would like, <laughs> but it feels like something I'll revisit when I get older and I get my time back. Because uh, right now, I, as far as I know, there's not a, a separate WWE booking game. Like you can do it within the my career, uh, the um, the GM mode or whatever mm-hmm. in, the, in the latest 2K games. But AEW doesn't have that. There's like there's Fight Forever, which is like the standard game. It's terrible. And then there's the uh, the mobile games that are just more Again, pretty bad. Um, but point being that, like, you've got a football manager, F1 manager. Like, there's not a wrestling manager, like, as a mainstay, like, in terms of a game that you can get every year. That would sell a ton. That yeah. feels like something that they should absolutely get on top of. Even if you had to sort of do fake names like Provo used to, um, there'd be a way to to do that. So it just feels like a really o- an, ov- an obvious open goal that isn't being served. So what, EWR, right? Yeah. Is that an E-Fed? Uh, no, no. Right, it's, so I did E-Feds, right? Oh, I did E-Feds, yeah, yeah. So E-Feds. What's, what's, what's that? Oh, it's right, an oh, E-Fed. Gross. I didn't play EWR E-fed. or anything like An E-Fed, E-fed right. Um, I think, the, if you don't know what it is, it's... 
bit role playing game. It's yeah. like wrestling's version of D and D almost. Yeah. In that, what you do is you create a wrestling persona. A I'm massively in, character. yeah. Uh, you won't be. <laughs> uh, and I did this when I was, I'm thinking, 1999. I've just opened a Power Slam magazine, like a, a wrestling magazine based in the United Kingdom, and I saw a picture of Raven in ECW and the like the crossover between the music I was into and the attire. It's just, I, I love that guy. I love Raven. So I basically ripped him off wholesale, and the idea is you'd have two people each crafting a wrestling character, and you would each write a promo, mm -hmm. and the person like in charge, I guess, the moderator, would pick the best promo, and you won that match, and you ascended up the card. So it was more like a writing game yeah. and okay. all the rest of it. So I used to do that, and basically, I think it was called Even Flow, nice. which was the name uh, of Raven's Finish in the Pearl Jam, the Pearl Jam song. song yeah. And he did a promo like in the Jeremy Music video with the American flag burning. <laughs> he was just such a, honestly, he didn't, he didn't really care about the rules this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my lame head experience. That's awesome. You couldn't, tell, like, you couldn't tell that from, but he was also kind of a hunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We, that was there. We, we had a huge cack as well. We, we joke about this now. <laughs> if only <laughs> someone would touch it. <laughs> <laughs> there are certain wrestlers that live an e fed life because right. they've got control. Chris Jericho is a fine example. Mm. Like, uh, I'm kind of the funniest and the hardest and the toughest, and I win all the titles, even though I'm kind of like the wacky clown. There would be e fedders that would be just like, well, you've got that, have you? Well, can I be the hardest? No, no I'm afraid I, uh, I'm afraid, <laughs> I'm afraid I use a steel chair every week. Well, yeah. What can I do then? There was also an e fed. Did you ever see trivia e feds? I don't so know. So it was like there was a shoot outcome element to it because the, you would do the promo element, the, the person that owned the forum would moderate all the matches, mm. but then it would be a round of questions and whoever got the most questions right would win the match. So you needed not just the ability to type out a promo in your wrestler's character, but the knowledge of the business. <laughs> so it was like you were being rewarded for watching tape. Early internet times were a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. The, uh, I remember the, the thing is, my comparison with that is being <laughs> <my> stuck. <laughs> I've had formative years of uh, being on various wrestling forums Stick during the Attitude death. Era. I'm a game. <laughs> Gotta be done. Um, a question from Sugi Ru, who says, UBP, who is the best wrestler from a fighting game, and why is it King from Tekken? Now, this might be hard to think of anyone else. We can all vote King if you'd like. Who was oh, Zangief? Go Zangief. I was, no, I was a big Ryu guy. Fair. In terms of wrestling characters in fighting games, Zangief's going to be the pick over Ryu, though. Ryu. Zangief, had, yeah. Zangief had awesome gear as well. And he was jacked. Zangief's a show. Yeah. I think we might go with him. A uh, question from Matt Reigns, who says, yes, hi, Matt Reigns here, the number one Sidric mega fan. Sidge, could your absolutely, Great guy, yeah. absolutely jacked son beat me in a game of FIFA? Been playing since 08. I want a shot at him. Just the game, though. Don't need him kicking my ass. I've been playing since, ooh, 1994. Uh, no, I played FIFA. FIFA um, International Soccer. FIFA it, International Soccer 1994. This is going somewhere. And pretty much every single year. What was the FIFA game where the friggin' goal nets went about 10 yards? If you blasted one in, it was FIFA was terrible at this time. Absolutely terrible. It might have been when I'd switched to ISS or PES by then. No, oh, ISS. I, 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 ISS. I think I played that FIFA game, and then I, just, I must have just looked out and bought ISS and then went Pro Evo from there. Basically, Pro Evo. When did Matt Reigns start playing? Mm hmm. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, wait, yeah, he's missed the glory years of PES. That's uh, when Sark wore was big yeah. in America, obviously. So what happened was PES was just uh, Konami. It was the absolute best um, football game ever. Mm -hmm. And then every iteration got better than the last. And then with all the budget and the licenses and the real player names, FIFA, like just total pricks, just went, right, we'll just pretty much try and replicate that engine and game mm -hmm. style as much as possible. But could your son beat him in a game of FIFA? I'm getting there, Scott. Well, I'm just... we've got all day, have we? Guy's a storyteller. Are you not wrong? Yeah. I've been playing <laughs> for 30 years. 30 years, and my kid just beats me now. Yeah. So I would say yes. That was the third act reveal there. I got there too early. Reading the spoilers. <laughs> shut up, shut up then. <laughs> <laughs> question from FM All, who says good day, legends. What? Couple of years since it's I've asked yes question. Yes or no, is it? I thought it was banter pod, not the yes and no pod. That can be the wrestling the version if you like. <laughs> the Untitled Answer Podcast. I don't mind yeah. at all. Um, <laughs> are we going to interrupt or are we going to do a question? A, good. Don't interrupt me when I do an answer then. Well, was that an answer? Was it a little story? I mean, what, what, how much time we got? Couple years since I asked a question, but stoked to see you guys always smiling. Just a quick one. <laughs> Is there still room for edgier games these days? Edgier podcast host, maybe. <laughs> uh, will we ever see a resurgence like Manhunt, Dark Sector, Hatred, Postal, or is this done forever? Cheers, mates. Oh, I included this one because we all grew up through, I don't know, life's attitude era, the Western yeah. Hemisphere's yeah, yeah, yeah. attitude That's era. That's a great way of putting it. And uh, I feel like uh, gaming itself had an attitude era as well, whether it's Doom, Mortal Kombat, Carmageddon, whatever. Uh, thoughts on if that can even exist in the modern day? Um, 
Who did it before? Like, like the edge lords. You know how there's like grim social media channels that are just for like like very very right wing or like the last remaining oh, yeah, edge lords. Yeah, yeah. Like you'd be servicing them. First and foremost, I think, because it'd be like wanting to be seen playing this game, but like, I don't give a damn about society's rules. I'm going to play Karma Game 6. <laughs> like, they're like teenagers, I guess, incels. I think this is like, uh, there's, there's a market, but do you want to be seen as the company that serves that market? Yeah. Well, I think, I think there's a way to do it because Mortal Kombat's still flying. I mean, the, the most recent game I couldn't get away with, GTA but 6 GTA is about to dominate. Yeah. Like, there's a way to do it, and it's the word isn't tasteful, but the intent has to be correct. Um, with GTA, what they've done to sort of differentiate from like games like Bully and Manhunt mm -hmm. and all the rest of it is this like sort of thin layer of satire. Yeah. If we don't agree with this, it's like a lot of sitcoms do something where they do racist gags, but under the veil of satire. Yeah. It, it, it done well, you can do it incredibly well. Like it's always sunny. Like if you can do a level of sophistication with it, and I think GTA does a similar thing where basically the idea is how can we best get away with the kind of thing that you want and we want to do. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a way of doing it, and uh, I think a lot of these titles probably died off because they just simply weren't clever enough. Mm -hmm. In terms of edgy <laughs> games, like I used to, uh, I remember, I had an, all my mates when I was younger were old, and they were all playing uh, Duke Nukem. I was just yeah, that was the exact yeah, game. Yeah. I was, I, honestly, all my like, they were always four years older than the lads who lived on my street, so I was like, I, was, I got, I borrowed it off one of them, and I was too much of a f moron that I didn't know how to install games on the family PC. <sighs> to be fair, it would have been a, probably a Windows PC, and that those are. <laughs> legendarily horrible to use anyway. Especially I, I had a compact Presario. Very good. Presario Plaza. That's some sort of uh, Packard Bell out the box deal. <laughs> but I was, Packard Bell? I had to teach myself to install games on DOS. It's too hard. Oh, too I hard. couldn't do that. Yeah, same. I had to learn how to like, forward call on run something. I was too... too <laughs> uh, yeah, same. Stuff. And I had yeah. to get the older lad to come round to my house to install it. And but then, then you would play it, it and I couldn't even do anything. Then you got in and it's like, oh my God, this... <laughs> Swearing in strip clubs here. Well, I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to live here now then. Like, DOS uh, was like this empty void of, I, I can do everything and nothing. I, yeah. What, yeah. Do I do? what do I do? Yeah. The entire, I mean, trying to get my head up, it's the exact same thing where it's like uh, the colon, the double dash. It never worked. It always wanted more stuff. Um, I give up. I think maybe that's the seed of why I don't game on PC. All three of us have gamed on consoles growing up. I don't know if you ever had a PC stint. but I, The idea of doing it on a keyboard and a mouse yeah. and a gun and a shooter. I I don't know how people do it. <laughs> I had an Amiga 500 so that I played Worms on. Right. I used to play Worms on a keyboard. That was I used to play Worms. Quite nice. That was the only one I could do. Mm. Worms and Lemmings. Lemmings, yeah. Honestly, like, I'm not saying this to sound the piss, to take the piss. PC gamers impress me with their prowess. Mm. I'll, I don't know. I'll just share that on social media. That will uh, do very well with that crowd. But, um, yeah, in terms of edgier stuff and stuff that was bound, very boundary pushing, I think there's, it just has to have the right intent behind it. Like, um, FM Hall is the name of the, the tweet that's uh, the account that sent this in, uh, mentioning the game called Hatred. That thing was pretty much seemed like a Columbine manifesto simulator. Like, there's a lot of stuff like that. But I think you can do more things like GTA. Sarcasm or parody will get you through a lot just of stuff. Just pretend to be satirical. Yeah. And it's it's like, easy. It's Mortal Duke Kombat still doing well. had, It's like Duke Nukem 3D had a sort of preserved in amber re-release where people sort of, oh, God, the, the good old days. There is an anniversary version of it, but it didn't have, like, this year's Doom 1 and 2 re-releases or the Worms 1 where you've got interviews with the devs and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you can play Duke Nukem 3D on, I think it's, it's at least on Xbox backwards compatible. Right. Um, but Duke Nukem exactly himself. as it was. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, right. it'll be smoother and stuff, but like it'll play a bit smoother. But uh, Duke Nukem as a character is—he's definitely died off. Like, there's no way to make him work. Like, yeah. Um, like yeah, he hasn't had a new game in for in, in forever since uh, forever. That was 2011. Um, question from Oversoul Gaming, and this is going somewhere. So hold on. But Alan Wake Two got an anniversary update that, among other things, adds accessibility options such as invulnerability, infinite ammo, one hit kills, etc. Should every game have accessibility options like this, or are some games better off appealing to their target demographic? Why? Not both. <laughs> I say this all the freaking time. If you like, I've just bought Doom 2016, right? Yep. I've I after three levels, I've just finally gave in and dropped the difficulty. Mm. Okay. I thought you might like this question there. Right, I've finally given in, and I'm now on. Uh, I'm too young to die, however the easy one is, and it's too easy. Right. right? And it's too easy, right? <laughs> it's great, obviously. <laughs> Why, if if you want a challenge? ramp it all the old difficult scheme up to God mode or whatever they label it, mm -hmm. or have it as easy. There should be no shame. If you've got a lot of time on your hands and you've made the decision to go, you don't want children or whatever, and you want to spend your time just being as good a game. I can imagine if you practice so much of a game and got into that flow state of so much, so many enemies coming at you, mm -hmm. so like the, the avoiding death by like a twat hair must be the most 
ultimate thrill yeah. and you feel like the god of god mode. <laughs> yes. That would be great. What if you've got two kids on any given night, you fall asleep on the set team because you're so exhausted by your work-life balance that you just want the thrill, no matter how cheap it is. And it is a cheap thrill of blowing a demon up. Accessibility <laughs> options, probably better than an easy difficulty because I'm killing them. It's like, there's no challenge. I would like to be able to, on and off, like a faucet, right? Go, right, I'm struggling with this particular horde of mutants, this particular gore nest. Can I not just have, for this one, just unlimited ammo, so yeah. it's blast, 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 just and but then they're still powerful. They're still jumping around the screen. They're still like firing fireballs at you, but you just get the beautiful sense, like a bit of a challenge. They should just do every single accessibility, every single level of challenge, and let people pick. That's why you would find out, like cheats, and that's why cheats yeah. were there, aren't they? Like there, I and think I could turn it off if I start to handle yeah. it. I think it's something like Grand Theft Auto is a perfect example. At this point now, I'm so out of that that. Just every now and then, I'll fancy a blast on it to probably have a drive and cause a bit of wanton destruction. Mm -hmm. Like that's it, just to get that out of my system. But it's like, oh well, I'm like inadvertently found myself with five police on my tail, and now I, like, <laughs> you know, I, I can't. Right, I'm just gonna have to just keep driving until I die. Oh, I've died again. Like the the unlimited weapons, or just like being able. Like I don't know them now, but I'm thinking of the PS3 one. I can probably still make my hands control the immediate cheat to knock all the stars off. Mm -hmm. Just to, just to know it, right, up down a uh, triangle, square, bang, and they're all gone. So oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. I can just go about my business again. That accessibility, I like. To, again, maybe it's just speaking from a very singular perspective here, but surely everyone's got their own singular perspective. Isn't that the point? Yeah, like, exactly. That's it. This, this is this is a fascinating thing because I think the industry itself has really struggled with this over the years. Like you've got like the origins of difficulty. Why why are video games even hard? Like that the origins of that are the arcades. Like the arcade, they're gonna yeah, make, yeah, kill yeah. you money that, yeah. and try again, and then that translated over into like the initial rentals and like games coming to the, like, the home. And it's like we don't want you beating the game, so it's still extremely hard. You'll pay again. You'll rent it again, um, and you've got a bit of that. And then that idea of people who grew up through that going like, well, I got good at this, and I feel good that I'm good at this. And then you maintain that, and then you go all the way to now. And I think. I, I think the industry is having a, an interesting, there's an interesting wrinkle to this because so many people are, I mean, it's not that they haven't been like older than 30, 40, 50 year old gamers before, but the medium itself is like at such a um, stage of like mainstream, you know, like your average person knows what a video game is and is talking about it and is playing stuff in a way that they weren't before. And that conversation on, well, why do they need to still be hard? Like that association with skill and satisfaction is still in there. And you've seen certain games, like the most recent Tomb Raiders have different difficulty sliders for like combat puzzles. Um, and there's another one, but like turning one thing off and have one thing maxed out. And it's like, is that enough of a satisfaction? And then the wider conversation on the artistry side of it. And it's like, if the developer, the creator wants to make a hard video game, but then, you know, do they have to curtail to like making something easier? Like, I think you can have everything, but I'd love your version of like, you should be able to hit a pause button in Doom or anything, bring up all the options, be like infinite ammo, um, you know, like movement speed. I want to slow things down. I want to do whatever yeah. on the fly. That would almost and then change everything. it when I get my confidence. Yeah. I want to do it on the fly, a completely flexible approach. I will say, right, I'm pretty hardline on the idea of I would just like an option in the game to do that for me. I just want unlimited ammo, so I'll blast them, blast them, blast them, and then knock it off for the next challenge, you know? Mm -hmm. I will say, right, I understand from the developer's perspective, um, I, last year or the year before, I tried Breath of the Wild, right. okay? I'm not very good. There are so many buttons, like your shield, <laughs> your crossbow, your sword, your dodge, your roll, and like some of the enemies are brutal. I couldn't deal with it, but I, for that specific game, and this is where it's like, there shouldn't maybe be a rule then, because, that specific game, I lasted four hours in the world and I was like, I can't, I don't have the time to do this. Mm -hmm. I was so impressed by how it made you feel, how it made you sort of feel confident, like you could take on, you start with nothing and then you feel all powerful mm -hmm. by the end. I understand the mechanic, I understand the pull. I reckon if you took that away from that particular title, the whole thing's lost. The yeah, whole thing yeah. is lost. Like if you just start Zelda Breath of the Wild, the whole premise is on discovery is on learning yourself. It's so intuitive. You don't get your hand held. It seems so intimidating, like the, the way it's framed. It's like you've got nothing, you're little, and then you've got, you can even see the boss in the background. Then the very first thing you see, it's like, how do I ever get to there? Then the journey is, oh, this is how you get to there. And it's, 
if you take that away from that title, the whole thing, I imagine, is just not the same. So it's a very complicated, mm -hmm. unanswerable question, probably. I think, um, before I pass it to Hamlet, I think like um, calling it accessibility options has maybe done a disservice as well, because that gets wrapped up in just making sure that anyone can at least get to the starting line. Like there are various adaptable controllers for people with different like disabilities or whatever it is. And it's like, that just helps people start the video game. Um, and I think that is more if more in the conversation or the brackets of accessibility. Um, but then you've got like the idea of like knocking, knocking the difficulty down or auto completing certain puzzles or whatever it is um, and customizing the experience. And I used to be a lot more diehard and like, and I guess my bottom line is like, whatever the devs intend, like if you want to make a brick hard game for three people that are going to get through, which will include Josh Brown, because he always gets through the hardest stuff, fine. Um, but most people won't even touch that. Like there's a game called A Thousand and One Spikes that were, like, was made like 10 years ago or whatever that was known for being ridiculous. Like it was a pixel precise platformer with spikes everywhere and you're either going to pilot the exact I've route through it, of this, yeah. or you're just not going to do it. And, uh, and I didn't even touch that thing. And it's definitely part of becoming a dad, becoming a parent, where I just can't be bothered with that stuff anymore. Um, like the Dark Souls, the Souls games. Elden Ring had DLC this year. I didn't even touch it because I was like, I'm just, I don't have the mental capacity for it anymore. Yeah. Or at least not in the first year of my kid's life. So um, I think that has an effect. And I think, like I mentioned before, with the industry aging up a bit and um, accounting for conversations around parenthood and gaming, um, you have a reduced amount of hours, but then you don't want to be annoyed for those set of hours. You don't want a three hour bash my head against this thing for five minutes of elation. You probably just give up earlier. Yeah, like, there's been a few questions here that's made me wonder. Is there, we're all speaking from, re, like, the most similar perspectives as the three of us we've ever had. Similar ages, and, like, mm. since you've had a child as well, like, similar sort of realising that the time is maybe not your own. Mm. What sort of discussion is there in gaming in general about what different demographics wants? Because in our mm. little space, it's mainly about ages and about, like, what wrestling is reaching what ages. And, like, you've enjoyed AEW and, like textbook in a way because that was absolutely targeted. You were the right? target audience. You were the millennial. Got, disenfranchised yeah, yeah. millennial audience was AEW's like MO day one. Mm. Uh, so it was like kind of easy to identify initially. Things have changed a little bit since. Mm. How does that work in gaming? So like what we're discussing is again, like I believe that there can be singular experiences, but because everyone's got such a different one and now with things like, so like if you watch a Twitch streamer, Presumably, you watch a specific Twitch streamer for the type of games they play and the way they mm -hmm. play those games. So you wouldn't want them, I'm guessing, to if they're like somebody that's known. You mentioned Josh on like difficult games. If you were watching Josh play a really difficult game and then he was suddenly given something that was just like easy, clean through all the way through, odds are you're probably not going to be as entertained mm -hmm. by that because he's not going to be as entertained by that. Mm -hmm. Is there sort of to the develop? think about that? Is there like, is there not this sort of a rather than a, an age rating for like violence or gore or whatever? Mm -hmm. Is there something in like Diff like moderated difficulty or moderated time spent, how many hours this is going to take you there. What's it called? Like the, how long, it, not how long it takes you to master a game, but how long it takes you to get it. There's like a, a setting where like hours play time or whatever. Yeah. It's just sort of like, I mean, everyone talks about different game time mechanics in different ways. There's like gameplay loops. Like what's the loop of a game? Like, um, yeah. When does it reset again? Like Mario Kart, the loop is just getting around the track. Like it, that's a literal thing, but it's in terms of like, you're going to get some power ups, then you're going to do, do it again and do it again, do it again. And how satisfying is that? And different farming Sims have that. And um, whereas like a bigger adventure, maybe doesn't close the loop until later. Maybe the story's part of that loop or whatever it is. Um, but the, this, the wider conversation in gaming is, is more about, I think because the industry's gotten so big and because it's so wide and you have such a breadth of production values, like you have the Red Deads and the GTAs at the very top of production, hundred, multiple hundreds of million dollar projects, and then all the way down to one person farming sims that then sometimes do extremely well. Um, I think, I mean, Josh, me and Josh talked about this on a previous pod, but there's not that set of games that everyone's playing anymore. Yeah. Um, occasionally you get a GTA 6 will be a massive one, but that's like one in a year. Like they're just, they're so seldom there. And difficulty kind of goes alongside that. The Souls franchise or the Souls games, um, that developer is one of the only devs that is known for making hard games. But I think the solution um, in terms of difficulty and how it comes across in games is finding solutions in the game itself. Like in Elden Ring, you're not knocking a slider down and you're not pausing it. It's just that the game will give you more assists. Like you can summon little dudes that'll help you out oh, yeah. or whatever in a fight. And it's like finding gameplay based ways to get you through so that you don't insult quote unquote, the people who want to play seriously or whatever it is. And it's like, there's not that, but the, the only conversation that ever happens when this stuff comes up, cause like I said, it all gets put under the bracket of accessibility um, is just, well, I don't need it. So like, and I, 
and a lot of people who grew up priding themselves on being able to get through hard video games. Um, and I totally get that. There's a lot of like, you know, you're putting a lot of your own purpose, personality, reason on this earth into a it meeting. It does feel great. Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, like, it's very rare for me, but it does feel great when it happens. Yeah, and it's like you're putting so much of yourself into that that when the designers say, well, we're going to take that out, we're going to make it optional, so you don't need to do that. It removes some part of the... Um, the essential feel that was there before. It's like, well, I can just flick a, a switch and who cares and just be there. But they don't have to do that. Well, that's the thing, innit? And it's yeah. like, that's exactly where it's at. But I think, um, I think like I said, I think it's a, a big, big conversation um, because people have less and less time, especially as they get older. Um, and like I said, there are only a handful, if that, of developers who have figured out ways of doing it in the game itself, where you don't even realize you're being helped. Um, you know, it, it, strikes, should, yeah. it strikes me as well that like sort of, you know, we know already that younger people like you're engaging with media in a very much more disposable way. Mm. TikTok and shorts and everything proves that like attention spans are like are getting smaller. Yeah. So the idea of a game being challenging, if it's not entertaining or if it's not sort of keeping you thrilled because mm. you can't do a level or whatever, like a lot of I'm trying to picture my kids like going on a, a Roblox game that just does not work for them or like it's either mm. too difficult or it's just not well made enough. On to the next one. On yeah. the next one. You can't. You, can I guess if you're rich, but you can't necessarily justify doing that on like a 50 quid title. Mm -hmm. But it seems like younger people would be more inclined to just go, no, not for me. On to the next one, on to the next one. Yeah, I think it's a sense of reward. Like, it's just like, what am I in there for? Is it, are you following a story? Do you care about what happens to the, whatever the hell is happening in the story? And is that difficulty, are you going to surmount that <laughs> for the sake of uh, finding out what happens later? Yeah, is well, that, one does it? It's, I don't know how much the desk comes through on the bikes, but um, sometimes it does. Comes through to my ears, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, the, the, the desk is making noise if you can't hear it. Yes. But, uh, yeah, it depends how much it feels worthwhile. Like I said, those gameplay loops, those gameplay mechanics, are they fun enough to put up with? Or is it, I think as we get older, it's just easier to be like, literally nothing matters apart from my life, my family, my own kids. Yeah. And clearly I can spend my time in a better way than bashing my head against the challenge or whatever for like a couple of hours. Um, final couple of questions. Um, one from, oh, we mentioned file size and stuff before. Quick question from Peter B who says, best sports game you've ever played. There used to be a lacrosse game on PS2 that was goaded. For me, it was, it'll be forever that or NCAA 14. Pro Evolution Soccer. Which Pro one? Evolution Soccer. Uh, Which era, sorry? We can, go, we can go for a couple of years. Era uh, mid noughties, mid noughties, mid noughties, PES. I don't know which two, one had uh, Pierluigi Cleaner on. Three. Right, I there you go. That's my favorite. Actually, <laughs> yeah. Mine was either like ISS and obviously it switched to Pro Evo. Three. I remember that Luigi Cleaner box art. I remember that being a big Orange deal. and yellow. One. Yeah. I, I, I hope that was three. I hope I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Right. There was a time when Pro Evo was king. Like that back and forth mentioned it before with um, against FIFA. I remember the FIFA World Cup game being abysmal and Pro Evo won that year. That might have been 2007 or something like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can have whatever sports game you like. It can be a wrestling game for you, whatever you want. <laughs> Pro Evolution Soccer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pro Evolution Soccer. That, uh, university. Oh my God, the amount of hours spent. It's one of the best times of my bloody life playing on that game, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, it's genuinely. A, like whole houses of people just like passing the pads off, mini tournaments, days lost, but like not lost, <laughs> like time well spent. Um, ju like just to go for something different than a wrestling title because that was kind of like where my game playing like came to an end was probably with GTA and then the odd wrestling game. Because um, the the big hitters are everyone's favourites. It's always No Mercy, or it's always a couple of the specific Here SmackDown titles. Yeah, yeah, but there was just one from. I've got a very happy memory of the. I had the. Remember the ginormous car engine PS3, <laughs> like burn through your TV. <laughs> the stand. big red so, bin. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had. Uh, I got like that with Fight Night Round Three, and it was the first game I played in HD. Show. And it was sort of like I wasn't even that much. I didn't really buy into high definition full stop because I don't think we had HD TV at the time, but that was my first memory of high definition as a thing. Oh, it is different. It mm. is better. Like this is a technology I can actually appreciate the difference in was Fight Night Round 3. Mm. I, I'm not a big boxing fan particularly, but it was just so fun. It didn't have like, the big thing I remember when I first played it was that it didn't have um, energy bars at the top and the aesthetic was just way grittier than anything I'd seen in a boxing game. It looked game. so real back then. The yeah. knockouts when they slowed them down and you could just see like the sort of crunching of someone's jaw or like, Blood and black eyes developed as you were playing. So it was like, oh, he's like, I'm smashing his face and I can see the damage. <laughs> I'd, I'd never engaged with a boxing game, but the, how it looked and how it played just felt one, like felt wonderful smashing someone's face in. And then I remember like you could do a career mode and as your guy got older, he would get like slower and fatter and you would just, there was nothing you could, this young guy was coming in and kicking your ass <laughs> and it was just, yeah, that's how it goes. You would have to like, just absolutely, you would have to duck and weave and nail them with that perfect sweet shot. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you weren't going to win. And it felt like it replicated a boxer on the downswing that just can't get it done anymore. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the fight night drop-off is insane, really, because they should have had them every year, every couple of years, and there was a run when they were great. Round three remains the be- the peak of that whole Round thing. four wasn't quite as good. No, um, yeah. there was a one called fight night and then a word, and I forget what that one was, but then it's been dormant for ages. And I know EA's, there's a game coming out called Undisputed, which is kind of, I think it's Undisputed, which is like a return to the boxing. There's not been a run of boxing games in, in a long time. Um, but yeah, Sport I remember- Sport itself has dropped off in interest mm, as well, really. Yeah. yeah, it could be that. And it's like, but there used to be like, you know, when we were growing up, it was like Tiger Woods, the fight night series, like Virtuous tennis or whatever like there was oh, every tennis. you know every sport felt, was felt nice as well yeah and it's like i feel like more genres are represented represented in the standard um you know yes catalog like we bowling we bowling was a nice time there was a basketball game where if you did enough good oh. combination play uh-huh. or it was a power up the the ball would spark in the <gasps> nba street Yes, and yes. You throw it from your own half and it would just go in. Yeah. It was like the best thing of all. Like, the ball's on fire. <laughs> ball's on fire. Oh, it's just in. It's great. It's, it's amazing. Fifth Street. Fifth Street. Was oh, you reminded me. Well. There was, yeah, man. Like that, that whole label that was a, a side portion of EA called EA Big. They did the SSX games. And then oh, SSX Street. Tricky. Oh, my God. Yeah. And it's like, I'll throw them in as my favorites. SSX Trick, SSX3. Um, and then you reminded me of NBA Street. NBA Street Volume 2 was phenomenal. Like back when EA would use their money to pay for phenomenal like PS2. soundtracks. Yeah. Like PS2. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and then that also dropped off. Like Volume 3, they made all the controls on the stick so you had to like flick the right stick to do tricks and it was like nah nah buttons were way better we had this down I don't like sticks brothers can we talk about this (laughs) I don't like sticks I like sticks I used to switch my Pro Evo controls to the D-pad rather than the stick interesting no no, I'm not not a sticks guy I think I did that with Pro Evo but uh, generally I'm I'm Pro Sticks Uh, my brain was too uh, stupid for the N64 control what the hell is this penis in the middle here for (laughs) Uh, just I wanted like the PS uh, like PlayStation One, PlayStation Two controllers. It, I, I think that's I think that's perfection. Mm-hmm. And like you don't or you didn't for the longest time need like Dual Shock was great, but you yeah. didn't need the sticks. And then it became like you this. Know, I mean, we jump I jump right past this in terms of a talking point because it's just things that you just take as a given. But that conversation on D pad versus stick is a thing that comes up, and especially in fighting games. Like if you're putting different inputs in for like reuse fireball, um, doing that on a stick versus a D pad. Like a lot of people swear by the D pad. I got sh- uh, it was a Street Fighter Four for the Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty. Mm-hmm. And it was really acclaimed. Mm-hmm. I couldn't do it with a stick. I just returned it. I right. just exchanged it. It looked amazing. <laughs> I wanted to do it. I love Street Fighter. You could have used the D-pad. Didn't know it wasn't, didn't feel as good. Fair, fair. I mean, I think, uh, like I said- It didn't I, feel I, as good as the old uh, Mega Drive ski. That's fair. I think it's an ongoing uh, conversation. We will end on a question from Nick Hudson. Who just says, thoughts on Donkey Kong Country, especially the soundtrack. Oh my God, right. Still the best soundtrack. The soundtrack is absolutely wonderful. The underwater levels, like, there's a song that uh, I think it was must have been popular on TikTok slash Instagram Reels called <laughs> Aquatic Ambience. Right. That was either a cover of the underwater level or whatever. It just basically, it was a donkey, it would try to be a Donkey Kong Country soundtrack cover. Just beautiful. Um, something like that in Jolly Roger Bay from Super Mario 64. Yep. It's, if you ever want to be wistful about your teenage years, that's the song that plays in my head mm-hmm. all the time. If you ever just want a calming, Oh God, I'm having a stressful day. I always put that on. It just you can just get lost in your own mind to it. It's wonderful. Donkey Kong Country, which I never really played at the time. I was a Mega Drive guy, but I've got a mini SNES, so I've rediscovered it through there. It's so wild how it should look more dated. Right. Because it's got the it's 2D, but it's 3D sprites instead of pixels. Yeah, like models that are scanned in, I think. Yeah. They're scanning the models. So it should look janky and experimental. Like, and like Crash Bandicoot y sort of look. Like with it's, a it's side so... scrolling Crash Bandicoot. If, like, it, if it was, yeah. It's just, it looks 3D, but it's 2D, basically. And mm. it was a way it cheated and to make it just, it should be this monstrosity that doesn't, that ages horribly, but it just still looks wonderful. The platforming is incredible. Obviously, it's got a franchise on the back of it. You don't do that without really tight mechanics. And there's, like, when you go on the mine carts, the little jumps where if you come, if you miss it by a nanosecond, you're dead. It is that exhilarate, uh, exhilaration, the flow state. So it's a great game. I've got a problem with Doc- Donkey Kong Country. Mm-hmm. I want to play Tropical Freeze, but I've read it's too hard, so I'm not going to it. Do is, it is, yeah. Some of the bosses suck. Uh, with Donkey Kong, the guy's too big. Okay. As compared to either <laughs> Super Mario World or Yoshi's Island, which is one of my top three games of all time. I've, I've played about 80. Nice. He's too big. So I don't know if this adds to the mechanic or the challenge, because it's a bit trickier than the Mario title. Uh-huh. Donkey Kong and even Diddy Kong, ironically. Too <laughs> big, it takes up too much of the screen. This is a pro, this is a thing that people get. Uh, I've never heard anyone mention this, but I mean, we might spark a conversation. In, in games generally, if your character occupies too much of the screen mm-hmm. and you don't get enough chance to see the challenges of the platform. I don't like Bowser or Mario Kart. Yeah. He's too Donkey Kong. Kong. He's too 
be. <laughs> to go from Yoshi's Island, which I would describe as a perfect game, right? Which I did on my little mini snares to oh Donkey Kong. I never played this actually. So he's too big. It's is, great, but he's also too big. It is definitely a talking point. I mean, I love like if you do third person games versus first person stuff. I love third person. I want to be able to move my character around, jump, evade, do whatever. And it's, it is part and parcel of like you said, you want to analyze the environment, know what's coming at you, dodge yes. effectively, whatever. Um, yeah, that's an interesting talking point because yeah, Donkey Kong Country is not known for its difficulty, but unless you had because you can save whenever you want on the emulated stuff. Yes. Um, and back in the day, that thing was just kind of brutal. Like, and there are so many cheap shots in that game. Like. Um, the different objects that are coming at you or whatever it is. And some of that does come from not being able to read much of the terrain ahead it's of too you. Big. But I think at the time, they just wanted to show off those sprites so much. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. at the time, it was like, games can't look any better than this. Like, it Sonic's looks big enough. Mario's big enough. Uh -huh. And then Donkey Kong comes along. <laughs> He's too big. He's too big. Hamlet thoughts on uh, sprite sizes. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I never once played Donkey Kong Country. Really? Like a massive okay. gap in my, like, I remember people that had a SNES would talk about it, but yeah, I mm -hmm. went Mega Drive, PlayStation 1, I think was my thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and SNES in general, I regret how I didn't put in the time on other people's Super Nintendos, because right. there's so many titles that look amazing on it. I was just like, too many goddamn buttons. I went three buttons. <laughs> like Mega Drive was simplifying everything for me. Mm -hmm. And then, the, as I say, the PlayStation just seemed to perfect it. Um, just when you were talking about difficulty, and I was, that's, I think that's where I was starting to think about like Crash Bandicoot when you're playing, uh, well, obviously any Crash level, but like when you play and he goes side scrolling for a little bit, it's a bastard. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> I watch, it's a bastard. I've watched it like, like it, my kids have tantrums. Like, right. honest to God, shoot tantrums playing that game to the point where I have to just take it away because the difficult, it's just... So it sucks on a long weekend day when it's like, get the Switch. And I, yeah. This, this is the thing this is saving my life. And for your own good, I have to ruin mine yeah. by putting it away. If they're not enjoying this screen time that I'm allowing, then what are we doing here? Yes. And like, again, I'm assuming that might be the case with Donkey Kong Country now. It's, it's the last resort. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a, come on. Like, <laughs> this is my free pass and you, the game, are taking it away. Yeah, that's me. a really good point. And yeah, that's when you were talking about that difficulty. Cheap shots, I love that turn of phrase for like mm. bits and games like, you bastard, <laughs> like that's not on. Yeah. Like, it feels like it's not on, you've done so much hard work. And especially in the era, I think now about playing Sonic, every night, get home, play Sonic. And I'm sure you both experienced this. Oh, well, I've got to that part of the game I always get to and then die. Yeah. Like if you were, if you weren't having this magic night... And Especially you the underwater bit. Like, Sonic 2 is one for me. I remember the one time, the one magic night where I completed that game, and I probably would have stayed up too late, and God forbid if, like, I'd have been distracted because I was like, my God, I'm in the zone. But ultimately, same difficulty point, same bit where it's like, yep, this is where I always mm -hmm. die. It's been a great time. See you tomorrow. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, like no saving, no saving games or anything. So yeah, it does. Yeah. I will say about like people going back and playing old titles now through emulators or mini SNES or whatever. The idea to save, like again, a use of my time if I had it is more appealing. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm, I'm going to try this again tonight. I've it's got, great. I've I got three more lives. I clocked a lot of the games on there. Well, three of them purely because I could just, uh, just I'm just going to save it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm just going to save it where I'm not meant to at the time. I think there are certain things that are just expected quality of life improvements. And it's like, if you're going to play a game from an era where the technology didn't let you do auto saves or quick saves or whatever it is, that stuff should just be present. Like a lot of those old games, like I said, were either made for um, the rental market. Like I've there's an a, hour a night to play, you know? Yeah, exactly. Before I'm too tired to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sonic it's 3 like, had a save, didn't it? Sonic yeah. 3 is the first one I remember having a save. Or be between levels, because loads of them did like password stuff where it's like, this password will jump you to level four mm. or whatever it is. Um, but I want to just hit a button. Like if you play stuff on the Switch now and you play the old games on the emulated stuff, you can just hit a couple of triggers and save. And it's like, just give me that for everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's interesting, like, just to round that whole thing out, that, like, I'm, I think I have a gut feeling that the average person plays on normal or easy. Um, I don't think the average person plays on hard. Um, and I'm just curious about that. I think that as the years have gone on, as people have just grown up and gone, like, I don't need to prove myself on this earth through hard video games, whereas I did, or you did, or whatever, when you're a kid, you're a teen, something like that. Um, I think a lot of people to go, like what we've just said, where it's like, I've got a couple of hours, I just want to smile for a bit. I'm going to knock the difficulty yeah. down, I'm going to kill some demons and do whatever. Um, and I just wonder if that's the average person. I have a feeling that it is. I always try on normal. I always try mm. on normal. And if the option actually exists, which I'll just, I'll, eventually I'll give up. But I'll start on normal, mm. might as well. I think it always depends how much it feels like the game is dicking you over as well. Like I'm playing the new Dragon Ball at the minute and some of the fights in that are just cheap as hell, um, which the devs have acknowledged, they've patched it and stuff. But it's that feeling where it's like, you're not respecting my time. <laughs> and I'm in an FU, I'm gonna knock this down because I need to get through this thing. Um, speaking of get through the, getting through this thing, it's been the Entitled Banda podcast, the UVP, the UVP. 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 I've been Scott Tilford, that's been Michael Sidrick.
See you later. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'm Michael Hoplet. See you later, guys. Thank you all very much for listening. Have a lovely weekend. We'll catch you very soon. Goodbye.